Okay, first of all, hi everybody. I'm Dr. Weiss. And I wanted to say to all my patients that I really do miss you. And I certainly wish we were in the office enjoying each other. But it's not to be. And right now, I don't think it's safe to have non-essential services. Because we should all hunker down until we get over this hump. And then we can get back to normal sooner. So anyway, let's get started. Today we're going to talk about COVID-19 testing and what is a false negative result. You're going to hear everything you need to know about COVID testing. Why is it important? Now we're going to talk about briefly today's review, a live review of important Orange County COVID stats and also um, a Hogue Hospital update um, as of July 13th. The last time we looked on Hogue was, um, uh, let's see, July 1st. So what do you need to know? RT-PCR nasal swab testing is the mainstay of COVID-19 testing right now. It's the most accurate marker for active disease. There's a new rapid antigen testing, but it's less, as accurate, it's less accurate and not as much as known. There's antibody testing from blood draws. It's really used for determining if you may have had an infection in the past. We don't know how long the antibodies are going to be detectable after infection. We don't know if the presence of antibodies confers you with immunity. So it's kind of a curiosity kind of thing. It's not really that useful right now. Things are changing daily with the testing. There are, let's, let's talk about PCR nasal swab testing. This is the most um, reliable test at this point for seeing if you're positive for COVID. There's many different manufacturers, various sensitivities and specificities. Let's assume they're all very sensitive and specific, and they all measure great in the lab. But in real world conditions, that's not, not, it doesn't really work that way. Now, as you, know, all, as you can imagine, all testing is far from 100% reliable. There are false positive tests and false negative tests. A false positive test says you have the virus, but you really don't. It's false positive. Now, that's not so bad because you don't have the virus, but you get pretty scared for a little while. You won't get sick or infect others. And repeat testing shows you're not infected. So it kind of picked up something that was a cross-reactivity. That's like, that speaks to um, sensitivity. Uh, that speaks to specificity. But anyway, without getting mixed up in the specificity and sensitivity, for our purposes, we're going we're gonna to assume these tests are all great in the lab. Okay? Now, but you can get false negative tests. That means that, that you test negative, but you really do have the virus. Now, this is far more worrisome, and it gives a false sense of security. You can easily and unknowingly infect others. So what are some reasons for false negative testing? Well, sometimes that nasal swab doesn't right, get, get the right particles in exactly where it's shoved in your nose. There, it, it could be due to the variability in the experience of the person administering the test. The virus can be, the amount of virus can be too small to be detected because the viral load varies over the course of the illness. Sometimes in certain days it's a little bit more, certain days it'll be less. Okay, and we're not exactly sure about this stuff. Remember, Everything about this coronavirus is only a few, uh, three or four months old. Now let's review what we know about false negatives. How often does it happen? And when's the best time to get tested? I, did a, I reviewed about 50 articles on testing. And uh, in detail, I reviewed about 10, in more detail that is, and made some notes. And basically, this is the best test, the, the best um, um, data that I've seen in, medical, in the peer-reviewed medical literature. It was by a lot of authors. Kuserka. Kuserka is just one of, uh, I think, 10 or more authors in the Annals of Internal Medicine in May. Now, they reviewed pooled data from seven previously published studies, five of which were in peer-reviewed articles already, and they've reviewed about 13, over 1,300 patients. These were all patients that eventually were proven to have COVID. And then they looked back at their testing history and, to see what was happening with that. Now, they found that the false negative rate for the testing is for the nasal swab testing is highly variable and it's highest within the first five days it's more most variable in the first five days after exposure so if you get tested if you were exposed to some, your, your kid or a friend or a, a um, an employee who you know is positive and you run out and get tested and it says negative well if you had the virus 67 two-thirds of the time it will show negative and even on the, on the eighth day of our exposure, the false negatives were 21%. Two, two, one out of five times, if you have the virus, it's going to be a false negative test. 
Now, based on this analysis, the false negative rate for this nasal swab test, they said is shockingly high. Um, and the best time to get tested about three days after developing symptoms. Now, I should point out that this is when, in a population where everyone is going to be eventually positive for COVID. So again, this is that chart. And where the red arrow is, was on the eighth day, which is the third day after that vertical line where you get symptoms. So that's where you're ne you're, it appears that the best probability of getting a accurate test as far as false negatives go. Okay, now, the, another study showed that the, um, in a study of 200 patients, the sensitivity varied and it was 93% for, as you would imagine, down, deep down in the lungs, 72% for sputum, and only 32% for throat swabs. So interpreting these tests depends on two things, the accuracy of the test and the pretest probability of the estimated risk of disease. Now, that's what's so important here. And I didn't really know this until I read this. Um, the more COVID there is in the community, the more false negatives you're going to see. Because if there was no COVID in the community, you would test everyone and you'd everybody would be negative and they would all be accurate tests. If everybody in the community had COVID and you tested, whatever false negatives, whatever negatives showed up would be false negatives. So that's why we're so interested in the, that's one reason we're so interested in the community, the positivity percentage. Because the more people that goes up, like right now, that's about 14% in Orange County and about 22% at Hogue. As that percentage goes up and there's more COVID around, there's more of a probability, there's a higher probability that at some point along, when you ever get, whenever you get tested, you'll get a false negative. So you can't really rely upon these results. This is not at all to say that testing is not critical. It is. Testing is still critically important. Now, it becomes less useful to us as the turnaround time increases. What's happening now is it used to be there was like a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time, which went out to 72 hours, and now it's about a week to 10 days. Well, at that point, we don't really know what to do. The test, because whatever the result shows, it really doesn't matter that much because if you got the sniffles and you got better a little bit, it doesn't matter if you're tested or not. But if you're symptomatic and you require hospitalization, so you would require more care, you have to do those things before you find out about the test. So that's the problem with having limited testing. So I hope that sheds a little light on false po full, what false positives and false negatives are and the importance of testing if we can get it. Okay. It's best when we're trying to track down cases and do um, that type of demographic research to kind of limit the spread. But at this point, if we don't have enough testing, that's kind of very, very hard to do. Let's now look at today's statistics and the way that I look at them. Okay. Now, this is the, when you get this, all this data is from the Orange County Healthcare data um, from today. And I've gone to OC COVID-19 at the Orange County Info. I just look up, I just Google OC COVID, and it's one of the first ones that come up. Click your desktop version here, and then you, it'll open a screen, and it'll show you broad numbers. The numbers that I think are significant here, first of all, this 253 per 100,000, that's way off the charts. The California Department of Public Health threshold is anything over 25 is very dangerous and should stop us from going forward with opening up on things. We're at 10 times that amount. So clearly, we're not really paying attention to that that much. What is important is looking at this testing positivity percentage, like I just said. Number one, the Department of Health's threshold is 8%. We're at 14%. And I mentioned, what we'll talk about later, that Hogue is now at 22%. That is indicative of community spread. And that is how much more likely you are to be infected with a virus in the community. Um, this is an important number too. It's nice that it's gone down a little bit. It had been over 10%. That's when we were put on the state watch list. So it's very encouraging that that's coming down. I keep my eye on these numbers too, because this is a percent of ICU beds that are currently available. And I like to compare dates as I go back in my browser. Well, these are different ways to go back. But anyway, and this is the percentage of ventilators that are currently available. So far, we've been okay on ventilators, and we've been okay on the ICU beds. But when this starts to go down, 
believe me, it's not a danger signal when it gets to the threshold, 20%. That's a, that's a hit an iceberg kind of condition. As this starts to go down, we should be very concerned and take this more seriously. Now, the only other page that I really care about, and you can get there by clicking on this um, window that comes up, they've changed this lately, and go down to hospitalizations. Because that's most meaningful to me. You can get, also get there by these arrows. Now, this may look different when you go to it. Because what I've done is they used to have this displayed differently. And as we know, these graphs make a difference in their appearance at what the how far apart the lines are on the x-axis and the y-axis. So you can manipulate the way the actual chart looks. But what I found is, if you look at this full screen, this doesn't look as dire as it really is. But if you pull this in a little bit, that's what you're seeing here. And by doing that, I noticed there was an inflection point. Something happened here around June 18th, where we started off on a whole new tangent. Maybe they started reporting things differently. I'm not sure. But the top blue line is the current hospitalized patients. And the pink line is the people in the ICU. As you see, we're just about at a, at a, at a record every day for the people in the ICU. One thing that was very encouraging this week that, and this is why the three-day average hospitalization average went down, is that could we be having a peak now? I sure hope so. So those are the things that I look at. I look at the hospitalizations, and I look at the, the initial data monitoring for this positivity percentage and the change in three-day average hospitalizations and the ICU beds. Now, let's go back to the presentation. And let's see how things are going at home. Now, this was from a um, medical staff meeting, some notes from a medical staff meeting that happened a few days ago. And a lot of the comments were from Phil Robinson. He's the director of infection prevention at Hope. Um, this is very similar data to what we were presented um, in July 1st when I during my last blog. But there's a couple new things in here and a couple things I just want to re-emphasize. Okay. Um, these statistics now are encompassing Newport and Irvine campuses of Hogue. To date, 737 total COVID patients have been seen. It was, when we looked at this about two weeks ago, it was 467, which means there's been around 20 new patients a day since then. So if you just want to kind of imagine what's happening in the community, about 20 new patients are coming into the hospital, to the emergency room, to be evaluated for COVID each day. So you can look at a group of 20 in your mind. It kind of makes it more concrete when you could think about it like that, or at least it is to me. Now, this next one is 333 COVID patients altogether cumulatively have been admitted. Now, on July 1st, it was 228. So that means there's about 10 new people coming into the hospital a day with COVID. So there's about 20, I guess, half the, about half the patients are admitted then. It's about 20 people showing up. Half of them are admitted. So there's about 10 people a day coming to the hospital. That's not good if they keep doing that every day because they certainly don't go out every day at such a rapid clip. However, there's maybe some good news on that, on that, in, on, um, on that venue. The good news is the things that are trending downwards are the percentage of patients requiring admission, the percent of admissions requiring ICU, and the average length of stay. So they're coming down a little bit, not too much, but that means that we're learning to take care of things a little bit better. Now, the not so good news is at Hogue, the testing positivity has increased to about 22%, which is, I believe, around a high. 21, 22% is our high. And that indicates, as we mentioned before, a significant increase in community transmission because in Orange County, it's about 14%. I'm going to reiterate that there are new, four new COVID symptoms that have been added to the list nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and headache. And we mentioned that there's significant pre-symptomatic spread, which are asymptomatic transmission. Transmission by people who don't know they have it. So um, if you're like me, um, you're starting to hear friends and neighbors and your kids' friends and neighbors or your kids that are testing positive for COVID. And it's no longer some, it's not happening to somebody else. It's happening to us. That's why masks and social distancing are so important. Of course, asthma and pregnancy have been also added to that list. 
It remains the only two methods we have to take care of people who are in the hospital are remdesivir, which has been shown to decrease the length of recovery by about 31%. The demand of this drug is critical and it's outstripping supply. So it's very worrisome until we get more of this drug. Steroids, dexamethasone is now given to any COVID patient needing supplemental oxygen. It does decrease duration and mortality. I think that was a study that, um, I know that Hogue was involved in a few of these studies um, about um, how long the virus can be shed. I believe this other one was published in England about the um, steroids, so that we've taken that up and the CDC now has that as a recommendation. So we're following their guidelines. So basically at Hogue, testing is very limited and we don't test symptomatic patients. I mean, that is, I'm sorry, we don't test asymptomatic patients. And that is why, that's one of the main, that's a, that's a good reason why I'm not feeling comfortable offering non-essential services for elective procedures. I thought at first, okay, well, maybe we can get by with having you come in. The, the operation is not that long. So we'll test you first. If you're negative or non-negative, we do the test. It's simple. But actually, when I started to look into it, there are some false negatives. And in any case, we can't get these tests now. Or even if there's one or two places we can, we can't count on having access to that test, nor can we count on how long it will be till we get the results. So that's kind of one reason that I'm just kind of um, sitting here at home making this presentation. Um, there's testing only symptomatic patients to preserve materials. Now, here's the thing that I talked that Phil Robinson was talking about, and he was proud of it. And I think we should all be proud that Hogue was one of the um, study centers that was instrumental in getting this information. There seems to be no virus shedding after 10 days from the onset of your symptoms. So, we know that people can still test positive for many weeks or even months, but we don't repeat testing after an initial positive result to see if you have it or not anymore. Basically, the guidelines are. If you're symptomatic and you're uh, from COVID and you've tested positive, you quarantine yourself for 10 days after the onset of your illness. And believe it or not, after that, you're not contagious. I um, have to go with the science on this, but I can tell you that I'd be wearing my mask. And that's why it's important to wear your mask until we know more details. But as of now, we haven't been able to find any virus shedding from 10 days from the onset of your illness. So for now, isolation for 10 days and providing if there's no fever or symptoms for the last three days off on fever reducing meds, you can go back to work. Now, at Hogue, basically employees need to stay home for 10 days if they have any symptoms, because basically most of what other symptoms are there here. Don't come to work if you have any symptoms. And if you test positive, family members should self-quarantine for 14 days. Now, family members are at most risk for having um, COVID, for getting COVID. Um, I spoke to someone recently, and unfortunately, he lived with his son. Well, unfortunately, his son tested positive for COVID, and they are living together. And that's the type of situation where you are at most risk for getting COVID, and you should really try to stay apart as much as possible. And that's where you should not use the same countertops or countertops or wear masks with each other and avoid each other in separate bedroom, um, bathrooms if possible. Okay, so we're worried about getting sick ourselves, getting other people sick, and asymptomatic spread. So what can we do about it? Assume everyone may be an asymptomatic carrier and wear masks to protect yourself and others. So thank you for listening. Wear a mask and social distance and stay safe. And I look forward to seeing you all as soon as possible safely.